to be patient in an emergency is a terrible trial. I am a designer working at Air St. Gross in Baltimore, uh, which is also near where I live. And right now I'm actually being put on the uh, Terrapin Development District <laughs> uh, project that is going to be right here on Route 1. So I'm very excited to come back to see the campus every now and again. Um, my name is Jemima Samoa. I live in Maryland, uh, Montgomery County. I work with Perkins Eastman in the DC office and I'm working on a project called Art Place and I'm doing CA for construction. So every day has been a learning process for me. <laughs> yeah, it's been interesting. Yeah. Buildings by themselves are no guarantee of quality of life. Many other factors, including the weight of history, urban planning, design, and even landscaping have real measurable impacts. For instance, there is a 20 degree temperature difference between the leafy suburbs of North Baltimore near where I live and the modest and largely treeless row home neighborhoods of East Baltimore. That's really upsetting. Isn't it? And there's also a 20 year difference in life expectancy between those two same neighborhoods, which is the same as the difference between North and South Korea. And we can't rectify these past injustices solely through a focus on future buildings. A far more holistic approach is necessary. You know, this reminds me of a Rebecca Solnit article I read this morning in the Washington Post about how we spend so much energy fighting against things we don't want instead of cultivating what we do want. Things, you know, like beauty, joy, a closeness to nature, um, community like friendship good food uh, a living wage <laughs> things that studies show increase life expectancy anyway in episode three of building hope we delve into environmental justice i'm julie gabrielli a professor of architecture at the university of maryland and i'm vincenza perla a current graduate student at the university of maryland Welcome to the Building Hope podcast. We're featuring environmentally visionary architectural projects to explore how good design can build hope in a world facing a climate emergency. Today, we're gonna to travel between Baltimore and Washington, DC to look at two projects in the heart of both cities. We'll meet Melanie Quintanilla, whose project focuses on Harlem Park in West Baltimore and we'll talk with Jemima Asamoa, whose work transformed a part of the Anacostia waterfront on the Potomac River in Southeast DC. Just a note, if you're listening on a podcast platform, you can find a slideshow of these beautiful projects on our YouTube channel at Building Hope Pod. Melanie starts us off by describing her project. So my project was a K through eight school in Harlem Park, which is a neighborhood in West Baltimore. Uh, I actually came upon the site working at Air St. Gross. We had the opportunity to uh, help the community development team make a master plan for their neighborhood. And one thing that kept coming up over and over again was the school. There were so many complaints about the school. It had asbestos, it had pests, and I, thought to myself, like it, the design of a school really reflects on how we value the people who are in it or the kids who are in it. So it, it made me, it kind of lit a fire under me to be like, well, I know I'm not like a real architect, but uh, I should maybe be part of the solution of just looking at this problem and start to tackle it. So for me, mine was to redesign the Anacostia Recreation Center. So my topic mainly looked at how regenerative architecture can help improve the quality of, quality of life of like blighted urban areas. So I chanced upon regenerative architecture and I found it really interesting. And then I was like, okay, so the principles of this topic is to improve upon the quality of life. I was like, what can I do? Where can I go? 
So while I was doing my research, I chanced upon Anacostia. I was like, hmm, it's really interesting sites because of like it's just it's in DC, but then there's like so much difference between that side and then the other side of the river. So it's like, what can I do to kind of like bring the people together and also help the community improve the quality of life? So it was a recreation center for the community, thing, but it had a beautiful waterfront. So the site was also divided by a main highway, which divides the site the recreation center from the community. So I was like, how can I make it easy for people to come to the community, whether they're walking or biking or even driving? So Melanie, your site is also uh, in a community that's divided by a highway. Oh, yes. <laughs> what a coincidence. Um, <laughs> what was your sort of take on that in, in the project? Actually, I find it interesting that Jemima and I are paired together because while she is supporting a uh, kind of community development project that is going on, I was kind of pushing back against a, a urban development that was created in the 70s. Yeah. So uh, another thing about the Harlem Park neighborhood is that it was deeply affected by the highway to nowhere, as you mentioned. Uh, it was an urban uh, kind of redevelopment plan that took out, I think 25% of the neighborhood occupants were displaced from this. And it basically created a scar of a highway that's kind of, it's dug into the neighborhood. So they excavated uh, kind of a trench through the neighborhood that doesn't lead anywhere, hence the name Highway to Nowhere. So it was kind of useless, and, but it deeply affected the entire neighborhood. And the school was actually part of the highway development plan. It was put in maybe as a concession, but the moves that it made were so against the kind of ideas that you would think of as a school. It was very fortress-like, there was no windows, it was just kind of a, a brick, like, giant fortress <laughs> yeah. that was plopped in the middle of the neighborhood. So again, a part of my uh, thesis was to start to break down that mass uh, and kind of create a, like bring back the neighborhood center that was once there by lessening the footprint of the school building and hopefully uh, providing sort of a blueprint for how we can tackle projects that are in these communities that have been affected by these urban development projects. All right. so. Both of the projects feature a variety of meaningful connections to the water, to trees, to parks and gardens and other kinds of landscapes. Um, what role do these play towards righting past wrongs and or fostering social and environmental justice? There were kind of two main landscape features that I focused on in my project. The first was uh, kind of bringing back the Harlem Park uh, Neighborhood Park, I think it was called, uh, that was in the center of the neighborhood. So when the redevelopment happened, they sort of cut into that park and placed the high school there, uh, which is currently very underused. So um, one move was to consolidate the high schools with a school that was maybe three blocks away. So sending students there, but bringing back that center park uh, and bringing back the, actually the lake that was there. I think I called it the green jewel <laughs> in my project brief, so that was step one. Step two was uh, creating a courtyard that was actually in the school. So the school, the new K-8 school would partly frame uh, this courtyard where students can actually learn how to grow things. There are plots for different fruits and vegetables and kind of local flora <laughs> that can grow there. Uh, and it really tried to combat the food desert that is in Harlem Park. As I know that's a very common issue, is that there's not enough supermarkets. And the, the community members themselves would be like, hey, why do we have to drive like 30 minutes to go find a supermarket while other neighborhoods have one that's within walking distance? So while well, it's not putting a grocery store directly there, but it is bringing back the kind of uh, community idea of a community garden and having food available for people to take. Yeah, I really, I think we had like really similar <laughs> kind of things in our projects because from my side, um, I, one thing I found really interesting is that it had a rich history. It was one of the original settlements for the Native Americans who cherished the river, the Anacostia River. And one of the things that they loved doing was also farming to produce their own food. But then they got moved away. So I kind of wanted to like, 
for my design kind of like respects that cultural aspect of it. So one thing that I did was to design a green bridge, which was connecting the people to the recreation center. And the main bridge was kind of like dedicated to the history of the site. So um, coming from the community to the site, you go through the garden, there are certain areas, there are sculptural pieces, which kind of like remind people of uh, the history of the land. Um, I also mentioned that they loved farming. So one thing I did, um, the Ward 8 where the site is located is also a food desert like Melanie's <laughs> site. So one thing I wanted to do is a huge site, like create a portion for community farms where people can have access to fresh food. And also I included in the design um, a demonstration kitchen where maybe chefs and people who kind of have like that strong historical connection to the site can come and come have some demonstrations where people can come and see how things used to be done. Jemima's Green Bridge is an elevated park over the eight lane highway that divides the neighborhood from its waterfront. She designed a greenway trail into and through the community so residents can bike or walk to the park or push a stroller or rollerblade, whatever it is, um, and they're completely isolated and protected from the traffic. And as it reaches to the other side, the bridge transforms and becomes the roof of her rec center building. There are even atriums where you can peek down into some of these spaces and then proceed down into the riverfront area. particular one particular aspect of your thesis project that's illustrative of your ideas and the kinds of the values that you want to bring to it. One thing that I wanted to look at was integrating kind of the culture, my culture, my culture into the building itself. I know a lot of urban development efforts kind of follow the like raise and rebuild model. Like we have to delete everything to erase all the wrongs and just start over from a blank slate. But even if we do that, it's it's not blank. It's still held in the memories and in the bodies of the people living there. So part of my project was actually a, uh, what do they call it, like a, a reuse, I guess. It, it didn't include raising the entire building. I took the kind of the remaining shell of the K through eight school and started to weave new open and glassy areas into it. So it's bringing back kind of the traditions of quilting, of collage artists like Romare Bearden, and of soul food, which was taking the scraps and turning it into something that was great and beautiful. So kind of making something out of nothing was the theme that I was thinking of as I was uh, adding these new moves to the existing building. I know it's hard to take something that has such a painful memory and try to make something else out of it. But it wasn't a technique that I really saw often or at all. Uh, so I, I wanted to try it out and kind of bring my own flavor to it. So for me, um, one thing I found interesting after I visited the site for the first time was the kind of like difference between the quality of life on both sides of the river. So I felt like the, both of the neighborhoods are like DC itself and Anacostia are all in one place. So how come there's so much difference between the quality of life or how people are living on both sides? I feel like, what can I do? That's one thing that I wanted to do, improve upon. At least the least thing I can do to improve the quality of life of the neighborhood. So having access to the waterfront and all of that, I think it would be great for helping, starting from somewhere to at least improve the quality of life of the neighborhood. But both of you actually, come to think of it, were carefully providing spaces for people literally of all ages, mm -hmm. from the very youngest to the oldest. Um, so um, Jemima first, like what, um, what's that flavor like in your project for you? So for me, again, the main thing was to improve the quality of life of people. I didn't want to like choose maybe just children or like just young adults or like elderly people. I wanted a place where everybody can come to and kind of like feel like they are represented. So I had like a section for the elderly where they can come there, have like meetings or coffee or anything. I also provided spaces for kids, uh, like 
very little kids and also had like training centers for like young adults. I think with a school, especially for younger students, it can be difficult to think of it as anything besides kind of a place that where you have to protect the students. We have to put up the fences, make sure everything is tight. But I wanted to think of it as not just a school, but it is a community building. Because what happens when it's summertime? Is it still a fortress? Is it still kind of walled up behind this giant chain link fence that's there? So I did include actually community spaces within the school. So the library, there's a wing that had the library, a kind of the demonstration kitchen like Jemima's project. And those space, that space becomes open at night after school is, is over. You can have classes for adults. Uh, it had a computer lab, like a internet cafe, where people could go to look for jobs or apply or just have internet in a place where maybe Comcast doesn't really come out regularly or at all when there are problems. So I really want to think of it as, yes, it's a school during the day and during school hours, but at night or in the summer, it really becomes an activated community building. Hmm. And you have maker spaces in there too, yeah. right? Or, so like people could, I could imagine a young person getting really jazzed about woodworking or fiber arts or something like that and then becoming right. a crafts person. Yeah, I mean, another, these are things that were directly said by the parents too. One thing that really hit me was uh, somebody asked like, why, like who are we protecting the students from? Ourselves? Because they're all living in the neighborhood. <laughs> So why is this made to be such a fortress? Are you protecting the students from their own parents? Uh, so that, that really hit me and got me to think about how to best open up the school. Well, still, there are uh, privacy and security concerns as always, but you don't see schools in the suburbs having 10 foot high chain link fences around the entire thing. Both your projects serve a civic purpose by reconnecting people to each other and to um, nature to, and to place, really. Jemima, yours is, is, the building is literally embedded in too and emerges out of the landscape. The whole top of it yeah. looks like a landscape when you're approaching it from the city side. Yeah. And Melanie, yours, as you mentioned already, is a frame around a central green space that has practical functions of handling stormwater and growing food, um, but it's also very beautiful, you know, and could be a place for wildlife. In both of your projects, you have screens and porches that create this kind of rich indoor-outdoor transition space for social interaction. Um, so what I'm wondering is, for each of you, do you seek to bring this kind of balance to the projects that you're working on now in, in professional offices? My experience with Harlem Park did spark a love for engagement and making sure that uh, all the vo different voices are heard. And that's something that I have been able to carry through in my projects. Sometimes even the engagement lead <laughs> for projects is going out there and talking to people and making sure that all voices are heard. And then, you know, transferring that back to my desk <laughs> when I'm working the Revit. And maybe being like, hey, maybe we should add some windows <laughs> and make sure that these staircases, door, uh, staircase doors are ADA accessible. <laughs> So I know that it's much smaller moves once you get to the offices, not exactly recreating an entire neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But I think we do, we do try to bring kind of our love for justice <laughs> to our designs. So for me, I was thrown into construction documentation immediately I got there. So I didn't really have much of a say when it came to like the design of the building it was already done when I got there. But again, the main, the design has to do with like, um, a multi-purpose building for the community, for kids, for artists and everything. So I feel like I'm still dealing or working around trying to like bring people together to a space. So that way I find it interesting, even though I'm not part of the decision-making dynamics of the project, but then I'm still learning a lot. So you guys are kind of in the position where you're these younger, less experienced people in the office, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel like we all know what that feels like, but are there ways that you can go into the office and maybe have your voice be heard or like in, like create a conversation for yourself with these people who are like, yeah, okay, yeah. you go do yeah. this thing. <laughs> yeah. and you're like, okay, but maybe at lunchtime, like I heard about your project. Maybe there's a way to... I don't know, like insert kind of yeah. this way of thinking into the decision maker's heads or yeah. 
Definitely. I feel like my company where I work, they are really open to hearing ideas from everybody and anybody. So in school, there was this project that we worked on which had to do with redesign of the highway which connects the Kennedy Center. Mm -hmm. I was just doing it as a student, but then when I got to work, I was actually called on to provide some ideas for a similar project that I found really interesting because like, I'm just new, I'm just out of school, I don't know much, but then <laughs> I was invited to come like, like give my ideas on how I think something can be done on that project because I felt like I don't have to have like 10 years experience before I can voice out some of my ideas. So I'd say pretty much the same for me, <laughs> <laughs> word for word, their uh, Aries and Ghost is very open to hearing everybody's ideas in the design process. I think it's also very interesting that we both chose firms that do a lot of educational work. Yeah. <laughs> that it just appealed to us so much that we can, even if we don't choose exactly what projects are done, we know the kind of vein that our mm -hmm. firms work in and how we can fit into that with the ideas that we brought from school. Mm -hmm. A lot of my thesis research was used for the master plan that we did or like bounced off of each other. So it, it did kind of build up and uh, there was an interplay between what I was doing for my thesis and what was actually happening in real life that I thought was really cool. And for me, just to chime in, yeah. one thing that I also found really interesting is that for my thesis project, I had this um, vertical shading devices, which was going all around the building to provide shading. And the interesting thing is the project I'm working on right now has a similar <laughs> um, shading device or kind of like things going around the building, which I found really interesting because now you need to go into how it can really be built yeah. <laughs> instead of just like putting on your building and see this stuff. That's exciting. Yeah, very exciting. Because you have, you have that body memory of putting that in the project for very specific reasons yeah. that are both practical, like shading, but also beautiful yeah. and celebratory, really, because yeah. that view of your building is so iconic. Yeah, funny. Yeah. Yeah. Your thesis had an ambitious goal to transform neighborhood scars into neighborhood healing. Um, those are your words, I think. Um, the design confronts destructive uh, racial policies of the past and consciously renews connection um, to neighborhood history, to green space, and among community members themselves. Um, and I'm curious if this was your intention from the very start of the project or if it emerged through the process, or even if it was from the start, how it might have changed or evolved as you worked on it. I know that reestablishing connectivity was a goal from the start. I knew exactly what site I was going to choose from uh, my speaking with the community members, but I didn't know exactly what design moves were going to happen until I looked at the historical plans that showed what was there before and what's there now. That's when connectivity really became, uh, like it, it clicked. Just seeing the difference between the, there were little streets that ran through kind of a grid. It was very, uh, like DC, you know, like blocks. They were then cut off. Uh, there were weird moves of like <laughs> giant loops going around kind of dead space. So I knew that stitching the street back together is also a way to introduce people back into these spaces. They were kind of dead and hanging there. We asked Melanie about the research she'd done for another course, a deep dive into Baltimore's racist zoning and settlement patterns, a history that goes back centuries and hangs over the city still. I'd say what I mostly focus on was kind of the migration of the Black residents within Baltimore. So I know, for example, Fells Point, which is one of the like, nicest parts of Baltimore, has all the little restaurants, uh, used to be the place where most of the slaves lived. Uh, they were then pushed out due to redlining, and there were actually um, these rules that I forget the name off the top of my head, but basically they decided if a block was above a certain percentage white, then a black resident could not buy property there. So people were being pushed out of their houses block by block uh, and being pushed into these less desirable places, uh, such as West and East Baltimore, creating what we now know as the, uh, I think they call it the black butterfly. Uh, which would be the West and East uh, concentrations of population. So actually, this does go back to the landscape portion of adding that lake back to the, uh, the central park. Kind of remind me of Fells Point and having waterfront property hmm. and like enriching what is currently there without moving the people who are living there out. 
Uh, I know it's a tough line to walk because gentrification. When prices rise, people tend to move. But I thought of like trying to restore what was there. It's a tough move, but that's what I was thinking of as I was trying to make these different design decisions. Hmm. So, like, if you owned a house mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden three white families moved in, they were like, buy or else we're throwing you in jail or something or would they yeah. pay you for your house or like so it seemed <laughs> looking, at, yeah, looking at the uh, newspaper clippings it seemed like it was intimidation that was basically yeah. police sanction they know. wouldn't come if you know if your neighbors threw bricks through your windows or set your house on fire it would be like well that's on you for living there <laughs> so it it wasn't a peaceful transition <laughs> hmm. it was lawful but it was not peaceful Like such a high barrier to entry for like nature connection to landscape and stuff mm -hmm. it's like free but it's not actually free yeah. and all the studies they've done didn't you you talked uh when we spoke in the summer about the urban tree canopy studies yeah. that they've done mm -hmm. in baltimore or other cities where they uh i've seen it the ones i looked at were mostly baltimore i guess because of my thesis but i know it's proven that trees can help with the health of people with uh what's called the urban heat. Uh, the, way, the way that heat is kind of concentrated in urban places, once you put trees, that dissipates <laughs> pretty quickly. And even the residents themselves were asking for trees at the meetings I went to. They were like, please, there's a bus stop. We have to wait in the hot sun. We need some shade cover. So it's kind of sad, but if you look at North Baltimore and kind of the area near Johns Hopkins University, it is full tree cover, beautiful houses. It looks very well cared for. And that's something that is really missing in East and West Baltimore. Yeah. All right, um, Jemima, you spoke already about that sort of how you brought the deep history of the site uh, with the um, indigenous people who lived there originally mm -hmm. in the whole sort of sense of stewardship and relationship to place that you fostered in your project. Um, I'm curious how the local, if the local culture of Anacostia informed your project. So, I mean, over the years, I mean, during my research, I found out that um, the area is right now predominantly black and one of the rich cultural, or one of the things that like, are done for entertainment is like artists going for like as a water festivals or something like that but there are a lot of artists they have these um, little shows where people can come and sing or some things like that so one thing that i also did was not kind of like leave that out but then also provide spaces where some of these things can be done so the one thing that i did on top of the bridge again is to have an amphitheater where people can come and have all of these little shows or like an artist wants to do something i provided all of these spaces where people can actually engage so, so it's 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 not your your generic rec center that has pools and indoor uh, basketball courts and locker rooms and things like that it's, it's really tailored to how you saw the community using yeah it. definitely thinking about what's happening in the community and how we can bring it to the center so even though i have the indoor pools the outdoor pools the outdoor pool again if i haven't mentioned is something that i kept because of its um history behind the pool so i love that i unlike melanie i got rid of the old building and did everything again because of all the other um, activities that i wanted to bring into the, the space the original building was way too small for all the things that I wanted to do so. I had to get rid of the entire building, but leave the pool, and then also have like indoor facilities where even in winter people can go and then have these activities if they want to. Okay, yeah, we. I'm glad you mentioned the pool. I forgot I wanted to ask you that. So, tell us about the pool. So, in my research, I realized like a very long time ago, it used to be um, a place where only white kids were allowed to go and swim. So one of the events or Something that happened there was like black kids were fighting to be um, allowed to also use the pool. So there was this riots around the pool and who can use it. So I feel like there was something really strong because I think after that riots, like black kids were allowed to be able to come to the center and use the pool as well. Mm -hmm. So I felt like it had like a really strong history that I wouldn't want to like um, remove it and then bring another pool somewhere else. So I just designed the building around the pool. I just created. Um, a direct view from the pool to the riverside. So 
That was one thing that was, I think, one of my favorite parts of the building, that once you're behind the building where the pool is, you can still have views to the river through an opening. Yeah, I love that story because um, so many of the municipal pools in the country were closed yeah. and abandoned and torn out rather than integrate them. Yeah. So this one was one that did successfully integrate. Yeah. These are really about the same thing. Wanting to keep cool in the hot weather by standing under a tree waiting for the bus or swimming in a neighborhood pool. Something we're gonna need to think more about as temperature rises. Yeah, and to have a policy systematically denying those amenities to some people while providing them to others is one of many acts of, frankly, cruelty that add up to a lower quality of life. Not to mention the lower life expectancy that you mentioned in the beginning. Melanie, um, in your project you include a community school, play space, solar panels, housing, uh, space for small businesses, a picturesque garden, a lake you mentioned, a pond, places to grow food and, and, and other uses. So I'm curious why it was important to integrate all of those different uses into what's essentially five city blocks, right? It kind of goes back to the idea of not just the school, it's the community. <laughs> I knew the original school itself was a four block kind of monstrosity. <laughs> if you include parking, if you include the high school portion that is underused. So by getting rid of that, it left a like a vacuum of space. That was something that was done during the urban renewal that really did not pan out well. <laughs> so I thought, you know, I can't do this halfway. And the entire site needs my full attention, not just the K-8 school. All of the different elements of the small grocery store that I wanted to put in there, the businesses, kind of incubators, those were all things that were directly asked for by the residents during my visits there. Um, and things that I wanted to include to, again, make sure their voices are heard in, in the design process. I'm not gonna say it's, it's like the perfect solution, It's that would be hoovers on my part, but I, I wanted to, think of it as more than just a school because it's not just a school. It's the entire community. That was another thing. Uh, I wanted to think of it as like the seed for later uh, transformations that would occur. Because uh, the neighborhood is, is patchy because of the residents who were displaced and the row homes that, are, uh, that have been abandoned. So by placing kind of the seed of a center, maybe there would be other development occurring within the neighborhood. Like once you have this kind of safe spot, as they say, that people would want to start to live there and actually want to be there and fill out the rest of the neighborhood. Um, okay, Jemima, maybe you knew we were going to ask you this eventually, but <laughs> how do you, um, you, there are two terms that you, um, that your thesis puts forth. One is, um, you, you call it regenerative design, and one is biophilic design, and it would be helpful if you could define them. Um, but let's start with regenerative design, and then we can move into biophilic. So, uh, regenerative design, one thing that has stuck to me uh, ever since I started researching it, is like the next step from sustainability. So, like finding less, less harmful solutions, um, and also finding solutions that um, benefit both the ecology and the people or the life of the people at the same time. So like finding design solutions that would be good for the environment and also would be good for um, the people who are using the design itself. Um, biophilia is bringing all these green or having this indoor-outdoor feeling in the design where people, even if you're indoor, you have like access to nature or feel like you are one with nature, whether you're indoor or outdoor of the building. So that's the basic understanding for me, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's helpful. So regenerative design has a kind of a sy systems, like a big picture connective mm -hmm. between people, landscapes, the city, and all of the parts, yeah. as well as um, the ecologies mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, the animals and the insects and mm -hmm. the birds. I think every, every aspect of a particular environment um, can benefit from regenerative design. Yeah, in the long term. Yeah. Yeah. And so. then biophilia or biophilic design is dealing mostly with the architecture and how it affects people. Yeah. Is that right? 
you can say so. So architecture and like having this indoor outdoor feeling of the building. So kind of like design principles that you can use to let the building breathe, if you can ask me and have people kind of have that access to um, green or nature, whether indoor or outdoor. Melanie's project includes the iconic forms of porches and stoops, but on a larger scale than houses. They form the edges of the school. We asked how she sees these spaces as contributing to her goal of neighborhood healing. Knowing that the street is a very important facet of the culture there, that people actually sit on their Romone stoops. Uh, you can walk by and say hi to your neighbors. They know everybody by name. So introducing a school that also has a stoop links it into that existing kind of uh, framework that's already there or a network of stoops that are already there. I also, I looked at uh, museums, <laughs> like the African American Museum in DC as a precedent. Um, that is, it, the, the, the porch and the stoop is really meaningful culturally as a gathering spot and of intergenerational kind of information exchange uh, uh, between everybody who's on the street. So again, looping the school back into that dialogue instead of having it be the fortress of solitude that it currently uh, is, <laughs> was very important to me. Before putting pen to paper, every master's thesis student spends a semester conducting research. They interrogate their initial idea refine the definition of the problem they want to solve, and they study relevant precedents. Their research ranges from big picture social issues to their site's specific history and culture, what are the needs of the community, and finally to architectural concerns like materials, structure, energy efficiency, and of course beauty. We asked both Jemima and Melanie to talk about some of the real life projects that influenced them. It was kind of difficult to find precedents that came at the problem of a neighborhood affected by discrimination and then also try to solve that problem. <laughs> so I, I looked at a mixture kind of of different uh, precedents, a very interesting school called the Henderson Hopkins School in Baltimore. So this is a real school that was actually built in East Baltimore. And one thing they did, well, I didn't emulate it completely, but they did bring the kind of tradition of stoop and uh, like public spaces and throughways, streets, uh, into the school itself by splitting it up into smaller, almost row home sized units. Mm -hmm. And then like carving out the stoops and the uh, kind of the trees in between and making like an internal uh, street in between the different classrooms and kind of the gymnasium and everything. So while mine, from the outside, it looks like one solid volume, something that I tried to bring from that precedent was creating like an internal main street. So if you go inside of the building, then there's a monumental staircase that'll take you through and places for students to just like sit and be kids. So I know uh, the current design of the school was just like the skinniest hallways you could ever imagine and classrooms with no windows. So it's very like, you have to go from here to here and we're gonna watch you the entire time. It looked very much like a jail. So uh, bringing in the internal street and providing places for people to just be was very important to me. Do you think of your project as being idealized or um, kind of realistic mm -hmm. uh, or both? So I can go first. Um, so one thing for me, I think in my, I don't know if I should say my life of being in architectural school is to try to do realistic projects as much as I can, or like, I didn't want to do something that, oh, it's just a thesis project or, oh, it's just a class project, so it can be done. So doing realistic, something realistic has always been like uh, one of my principles that I use when I'm designing. So from the feedback that I got from my thesis point, <laughs> I think my project, my project is, I would say, is realistic enough that if we want to like um, move to the next stage and kind of develop it, it's something that I feel like will really bring a difference or change the dynamics of the community. 
I had to present rooms. it to my office, and they were like, oh, let's build this. This <laughs> seems buildable. Yeah. It's, like, it's ready to go. Why not? So, <laughs> yeah, I tried to make it as realistic as possible. So I think it was pretty realistic. Yeah. That's a good thing. Though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, and, and it's funny because um, when I look at it, especially a couple of the views that you have of it, um, it's a pretty way out there project in some ways. Like yeah. it's mostly it's sort of embedded into the landscape. It's got this giant green bridge. And, yeah. and yet w each of the parts and aspects of it are like, oh, yeah, community test kitchen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Farm. OK, yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're cool. I can see it. Yeah. I'm already on, at that amphitheater watching some yeah. kind of <laughs> And I tried, even like, for the renderings, I tried to like bring the, um, imagine how the view, if you're on the amphitheater, like the view into the city and kind of like bring yeah. it into it. There have been proposals to kind of like redevelop the whole waterfront area. So if I was going to like base my thesis on this proposal, then it has to be realistic. There's no way around it. That's pretty funny because I feel like mine was the complete opposite. <laughs> Uh, I, I don't think it was realistic at all, but I say that <laughs> not because like, oh, the structure couldn't hold everything up or because this part could never exist, but because I wanted my thesis to raise the question of what do we value? Mm -hmm. Right now, we don't value schools, <laughs> especially in the city of Baltimore. I'm just saying if, if students have to be in a classroom with rats and roaches with AC that doesn't work, they actually have to call off school when it's too hot because they don't have AC and it's a danger to the students. So we obviously don't value the students or learning education. Mm -hmm. So by having this like completely pie in the sky, like what is the most ideal version that we could aspire to? I'm hoping to at least kind of give a kick to people to be like, hey, like look what could be here yeah. if we wanted it to be <laughs> as a society. And that, that question of look what could be here is so well thought through at every level in your project. Like it's it's beautiful, like the drawings. So in a, in, a, in an odd sort of way, I think of it as 100% realistic. Yeah. If we lived in that, I mean, that's yeah. the world I want to live in. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's the world we all want to live in. Do you see yourself as part of a movement? And if so, how would you define it? And how do you think it's going? Getting in the work field or the workforce has been like a great learning experience for me. I feel like every single day I learned something different. Um, the main, I guess, thinking behind me going to the working field is to kind of like be open-minded to learning a lot right now. Um, definitely still have the love for um, fair living, environmental justice, and kind of like providing like the basic designs that will provide like the basic needs for people. I wouldn't say I'm part of a movement right now, even though I kind of like have it in the back of my mind that I want to do like more sustainable stuff, more regenerative stuff, which will kind of like um, affect the lives of people. Right now, I feel like I'm still learning to get there, but I know definitely in the future, it's something that I'll love to like look into or kind of like be a part of, yeah. Yeah, similar. <laughs> I think similarly. Yeah. I'm not sure if I would call myself part of a movement. I know, though, that uh, I bring something different to the table just by like existing and kind of our different experiences uh, enrich the design conversation. And I know that's something that's very important for me. I like volunteer for the Kids in Design Committee. Um, but we do kind of like portfolio reviews for students who are in high school in Baltimore City uh, and kind of other events like that. I think that um, something really important to me is to make sure that these different voices are included in the design of the future. Mm -hmm. So like, who, what are the architects in a 50 or 100 years from now, what are they looking like and how can I start to uh, kind of change that and make sure that everybody is included in the design process? Because I know we've we can't just have engagement sessions like that doesn't really get the details of everybody or what everybody wants. We need architects from all different type, kinds of lifestyles and all different backgrounds. I, I see movement in my mind. I think of like my grandparents. They're <laughs> part of the NAACP. They're getting arrested at lunch counters. They're like wow. speaking out. And I'm like, yeah, I'm just uh, making the thesis. <laughs> and like looking at kids' portfolios, it's not that serious, I guess. <laughs> it doesn't feel like it. 
movement to me is reserved for like the elders who have had to go through so much more. So for me, I'm like, oh, I'm just like a person who's trying to be good. <laughs> mm. I love the humility of that. In a way, you're doing it from the inside of the system now. They were like by a matter of policy and and sort of like societal agreement excluded from a lot of things. So they were kind of on the outside having to demand to be let in. And now you here you are with your master's degree and, and, and a job working for a really excellent firm on cool projects. So I think using your your privilege in all of those arenas to help uh, high school kids is is a form of being a part of a movement. I was actually uh, bused from a different school zone, like out of Davisburg, to North Potomac, which is like super rich, like the diplomats kids went to elementary school there for a few years. Uh, and there was such a difference of being in a school like in my original school, they wanted to bump me up some grades because the kids were learning like colors in kindergarten and first grade. And I was like, what? Like, this is insane. And they were focusing on feeding their students versus teachers in North Potomac who could just teach mm -hmm. and have students that, I guess their expectations were much higher for their students and the students always rose to meet those expectations. Mm -hmm. So again, looking at Harlem Park and being like, if I had gone to school there, I don't know if I would be here doing my thesis, having my master's, uh, being supported in the same way educationally. So that, that, that really stuck with me, the, using my privilege for lifting up other people. The inheritance that you have on your back, as well as just having to be patient in your own internship as young architects, it's a lot. So um, <laughs> I'm not saying you're not up for it, because you, you're, you're totally up for it. But, um, what is that, like that idea of being patient in an emergency, does that, does that resonate with you? And you can say no. Yeah. See, <laughs> <laughs> so it's critically important that we get a lot of things right in the next yeah. 50 years. <laughs> I'll put it out. I know that uh, the climate, like everything is changing. But at the same time, I, I know myself and I know that urgency can sometimes override logic and that sometimes calm in the storm is what you need. So I, I know that this is one of the best times in history to be me, to be a black Latin American daughter of an immigrant female in this country. Uh, and that kind of bolsters me up like, hey, my ancestors had to do like a lot worse, <laughs> like a lot less. <laughs> they had a lot less and they had to do a lot more with it. I'm riding on the shoulders of giants. <laughs> mm. Like a lot has been happening. And I think that gives me a lot of hope for the future uh, that I can carry with me. Uh, to kind of offset the, to not get overwhelmed by dread, but instead, um, like, I think we're going to make it, essentially. Yeah, I feel like <laughs> we don't have any choice but to be patient, actually, because thinking about short-term solutions right now, as we are saying, we have just seven years. If you had uh, thinking of a solution right now, and then you have to think of like, how is it going to be in the next five years, you're probably going to come up with a quick solution, but then having the patience to think about how whatever decisions you're making or choices you're making right now can still be effective in the next like 20 years or 50 years is something that I think is all we all want to achieve. So you don't kind of don't have any choice but to be patient right now to get it right once and for all. Being panicked is not a good mindset for solving problems like this. Yeah. What is an example of a place or a bit of writing or an image or a movie or some kind of story, some some cultural artifact, let's say, or place that illustrates your thesis idea. For me, um, again, it goes back to my precedent studies in South Korea, so where they had to chain like an 18 lane highway, mm -hmm. elevated highway to like a green space. Um, looking at um, from research how much change it brought to the community of the area, I feel like my project, if built or if like made realistic, could be something that could bring that much change to the neighborhood. Yeah, I think I also touched on the kind of different facets of black culture that came from using the scraps. But one thing, I guess a mantra that I repeated in my mind is my grandma saying, make something out of nothing. So like, even if you're not given the proper tools, you have to go find them. You have to go get them. Like, uh, so that's 
that's something that really pushes me forward, not just in the thesis, but on the day to day. I'm going to ask you, each of you, how are you building hope? I'm building hope by learning. That's one way I can put it. Yeah, by learning as much as I can to get things right once and for all. I'm building hope by representing, which was something that I used to be not maybe, a little bit resentful that I had to be the face of a culture or a people. But now I find that like seeing people's faces light up, they're like, oh my gosh, you're an architect? So I'm not fully an architect yet, but yeah. <laughs> just seeing uh, how people light up when they see somebody that looks like them in a, like, face it, let's face it, a position of power over the future. Yeah. I can relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> I am a kid. Yeah. Thank you for listening to Building Hope. Our next episode is Building Hope by Caring, and we'll look at the power of good design to build strong communities and celebrate shared history. Building Hope is... Julie Gabrielli, Director. Vincenzo Perla, Research Assistant. Maisha Islam, Graphic Designer. Rona Cobell, Editor. Raymar Toison, Music. Hannah Zozobrado, Assistant Producer and Social Media Head. Gabriela Feinberg. Technical director and producer. Again, you can find images of these projects on our YouTube channel at Building Hope Pod. Visit our website, buildinghopepodcast.com, for show notes, transcripts, guest bios and curriculum materials that you can download and use in your courses. Come follow us on Instagram at Building Hope Pod. And we're on Substack at Building Hope. Please share and rate Building Hope on your podcast app to help others find us as well. This project is supported by a Faculty Student Research Award from the Graduate School, University of Maryland, as well as grants from the University's Sustainability Fund and the School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation.